honored to be here with uh, the one, the only William Elliot Whitmore, sir. Um, Pleasure to have you on the show this thanks week. Thanks for having me. Hey, Thank not you. a problem. Um, first off, I noticed when listening to your stuff that your lyrics are kind of um, on the darker side. What kind of inspiration do you get get from to give you have lyrics like that? Well, I, I first started writing these songs and all the songs for these records. Um, after my, my parents passed away when I was younger, and, and um, pretty untimely deaths, both of them. And, and uh, I had played music previous to that, and sort of was getting into uh, songwriting previous to that. But then when those events happened, it sort of uh, shaped my whole songwriting style into, instead of uh, doing it as a creative outlet, it became sort of a necessity, sort of a like therapeutic thing rather than kill myself or anything like that. I thought I'd write songs and, and uh, try to create something beautiful out of something uh, so ugly. And, but that's that's sort of when all those dark themes started to happen. Was experiencing a lot of death in the family. That, that tends to do that kind of stuff to people. Um, now, why this style of music? I know you're surrounded by a bunch of hardcore bands. It seems like 10 grand. Or so for people like that, and you kind of stand out as being, you know, I'm the banjo player kind of guy. You know, why why that style of music? Why not something along the lines of what everybody else is doing? Well, I I, I grew up listening to that old time stuff. I grew up on a farm, which I still live on, down in Lee County, Iowa, and so I was sort of geographically isolated from a lot of stuff that was going on musically, like as growing up. So I uh, grew up listening to like my grandpa's records and my folks' records, and so it was a lot of that country uh, blues, like a lot of Lead Belly and Hank Williams and, right. and Johnny Cash, sort of the, the staples of <clears throat> of that kind of stuff. And so I got really into that at a young age, and then maybe around age 15 or 16, I started getting into uh, uh, skateboarding. Right. And kind of the whole skateboarding culture, and, and so I started reading. You know, I grew up in a cornfield, and so <laughs> I would get these skateboard magazines and flip through them, and that's how I decided what bands. You know, it was like the Minutemen and Fugazi, and you know, and just all like Circle Jerks, and good stuff like that. So I started getting into the whole punk rock and kind of hardcore thing and the DIY thing, and I started yeah meeting bands like Ten Grand and Four Stella Ford, who were just these kids that were touring on their own and just sort of putting out their own records and doing these things without the help of anyone major, and so it was really inspirational. And so I thought, man, if I can sort of combine the music that I like with this new music that I like, this sort of hardcore stuff, if I can play my country music in this hardcore scene, or, or whatever you want to call it, then man, I could really, I could really have something, because there's a real hunger there in that DIY scene, and, and playing those basement shows, and, and setting up your own tours. And, so it was it was a good way for me to sort of like blend them together, because blues blues and hardcore are the same thing, really. You know. Yeah, technically. Being, you get being, down to it. being sad or mad about your surroundings and just sort of being right. dissatisfied about what's going on, and so different sides of the same coin. So it's it's a good way to bring those worlds together for me. Now, when you play shows with bands a lot in that vein, and I've noticed that uh, from stories I've heard. When you play shows with bands like that, that you tend to steal the audience away from them. Does that does that still kind of does that boggle your mind? Yeah, it does. It, I I never expect to find fans of the the hillbilly music. You know, I, I never I never expect to see kids in Misfits T-shirts really perking their ears up. You know, it's so nice. It's really it's really good to be able to sort of turn these kids on to music that I like the same way I was turned on to punk rock at a certain time and it, it just changed my whole life, you know, and so I'd like to do it the other way, like introduce them to some of this old shit, you know, and, right. and, uh, and sort of get them turned on to that and maybe turn their world around a little bit. And so it's, but it's always kind of odd to see, you know, those people kind of listening. Uh, I never, I never expect them to listen, but when they do, it's nice. Now. I've read somewhere that a lot of people are comparing you to um, Johnny Cash, Tom Waits, stuff like that. Do you feel any kind of pressure when you go to sit down and write a song with people saying, well, hey, he reminds me of this guy? Do you feel like you have to live up to, to any kind of expectations? Um, no, not really. I, I, those are 
very good compliments, by the way. I, I, I couldn't, I'm not fit to shine either of their boots. Tom Waits or Johnny Cash, I don't think I could even be compared to either of those. Right. They're musical giants to me that I really admire, but I, I take that as a hell of a compliment. But uh, now I, I guess I just, I try not to let it, I, I try not to think about it, I guess, when I'm writing. Because you know, I guess if you thought about it too much, it'd drive you crazy. You'd never write anything if you were trying to write a song as good as Tom Waits or Johnny Cash or right. trying to write a song as good as Give My Love to Rose. Oh, you know, that's, that's such like, an amazing song. It's like, yeah. oh, you, you'd, you'd never write anything because you'd, <laughs> you know. You'd so, in front of a guitar. Yeah, so I try to, try to just not think about it. But those comparisons, I really, I feel honored that anyone would even say that. You, know. um, you do a lot of touring. Now, what kind of, what places are your favorite to play? Oh man, so many great corners of the world to play. I, I, I love touring the states the most. And I've played in almost every state. And, uh, but going overseas is nice too. And uh, going over to Europe, and they, they kind of like that America Americana hillbilly stuff over there too. And there, there's an audience for it. And um, so yeah, I have I have great shows in really oddball places like Croatia and Austria. And, Germany and like Slovenia, you know, I'll end up having these great shows in these little sort of places that I wouldn't have thought would have fans of that kind of thing. That's why the hot chicks are in Croatia. Yeah, I like hate in that corner of the world. Yep, yep. There are some beautiful ladies. There's beautiful ladies everywhere. That's for sure. But but yeah, there's just there's so many so many great places to play. And every 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 region, every state, every different country has its own redeeming thing about it, you know. Right, right. And uh, they're all beautiful in their own way, and so it's nice to be able to sort of use music to uh, explore the world a little bit. And it's got to be easier to uh, do a tour than any, any other band would be, because you basically just go with a banjo, guitar, or something like that. Yeah, it's it. nice. I've yeah. got an easy load in, yeah. you know, and no fuss, no muss. Right. Frankly, I don't know how most bands even do it. I don't know how they, like I've toured with punk rock bands a lot before. And so I know what it's like to be loading in and out each and every night and, and doing that. I don't know how bands last doing it. Well, I mean, you it put on like a half hour, 45 minute set where you're just like giving your heart and then you got to tear down all your own equipment. Load down your yeah. Ampeg 810 bass cabinet <laughs> down the stairs, right, you know, or, right, or right. up out of the basement that you were playing in or whatever. And so, right. so I just admire bands that can sort of do it on that level. Bands like Four Stella Ford that did it for years yeah, and years. And bass or uh, drummers that jump off their bass drum and right. still sitting down. <laughs> guys, now, um, getting back to you being on the road all the time, you um, have any road stories that you want to share that you find really interesting that it's something that might have happened to you? Yeah, there's man, there's always oddball stuff happening. But yeah, one time, I guess one would be, uh, I was playing a show in Brighton, England, which is about... Uh, a couple hours south of London, mm -hmm. and I, I had a, a guy that was heckling me throughout the entire show, and I never really had a heckler before, and he was sort of being real disrespectful and in the middle of my song saying disrespectful things, and I was kind of just letting it go and letting it go, and, and you know the rest of the audience was real into it, and, and uh, so this guy kept going and kept going, and was just being relentless, and finally another guy in the audience whose name happened to be William, I found out later. Uh, in the middle of one of my songs, he goes over to this guy that's heckling, and he headbutts him right in the face, gives him what they call the, the Glasgow kiss. <laughs> and I'm just, I keep playing and I don't stop, but it's just, it was just a really crazy thing. He didn't, you know, say, hey, shut up, or anything. He just went over and headbutted the guy right in the nose, bloodied his face all up, and, and drugged the guy out of there. And I said, hey, all right, man. That was really cool, man. He, the guy I talked to the guy later, and he's like, "Yeah, my name's my name's William too, and I'm sorry I had to deal with a riffraff like that." Man, that guy was that guy was pissing me off, right, you know. Right, right, yeah. So that was an interesting thing to see at a show. Yeah, but there's always oddball stuff happening. Like anything, that. anything bad ever happened to you on the road? Like, uh, oh no, nothing, nothing other than you know just the uh, the breakdowns and the. You know things like that, but I feel fortunate that nothing really. Uh, you don't have to worry about bands like uh, that would carry a like a U-Haul with them with all their gear and it getting stolen. Right, yeah. right, yeah. I've had some run-ins with the police on tour that I that I uh, wish hadn't happened, you know, and things like that. But uh, hell, that was probably my own fault. 
but, but yeah, cops, the cops go after people that you know they don't understand. Yeah, That's I might be an easy target. Yeah. I require more understanding than some people. So. What uh, growing up, getting back to inspirations and stuff, um, who in the most like really kind of stuck out to you? Like you said, um, you know, Hank Williams, people like that. But who like really kind of grabbed you at an early age? A guy by the name of Ralph Stanley. Uh, who's just, he's still alive, he's 86 years old, and he is what I consider to be the father of, of any kind of old time music. And, uh, well, he was, he's the one that sings that Oh Death song on uh, that Oh Brother Where Art Thou soundtrack. Okay. That's Ralph Stanley. Okay. He's, okay. Yeah, like I said, he's like 86 years old, and he still plays, he still plays out. But he was a guy that right away was real inspirational, and he's just, he wasn't afraid to do like the acapella songs, and, 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 uh, I don't know, he had like sort of different arrangements, you know, than a lot of the old timey guys had. And he was a real good banjo player. And, and uh, Ralph Stanley was a guy early on that I kind of singled out and, and uh, really tried to strive to be sort of like his style. You know? Now, people out there who hear your music and they think, well, that's pretty easy to do. Okay, that, you know. New kids coming up and saying, "Well, that's you know, must be pretty easy to do, just having the guitar, the banjo, and what have you." Um, anything you want to say to them about how it's not really easy and you're just jumping the gun, kind of thing? Well, I would say that the thing is, the thing is, it is pretty easy, and that's that's. I, I would hate for people to even find out how easy it is to play the banjo, because <laughs> because anyone can play the songs I play on the banjo, but uh. But it's not always easy to uh, to find the inspiration to write songs, and uh, and I, I definitely consider myself a songwriter more than I would consider myself a musician. I, I can't play guitar that well or banjo that well or anything, but I try to, you know, I, I strive to to write good songs, and that that ain't always easy. It, I can imagine. It's sort of um, well, I, I feel like I you know I've had a lot of inspiration. It can be tragedies or good things but, but a lot of inspiration and that's sort of where the hard part comes in is, is writing them good songs and, but uh yeah the banjo picking and the guitar playing that's pretty easy like so it's, i want people to know that yeah don't don't think it's real hard and so you know they won't try it or something i want kids to try it you know pick up a banjo and, and uh, try playing it because it, it might be easier than you think and maybe you could write a song or two on it Put me out of business. I don't know. Well, I don't think you want that way. Um, from hymns to the hopeless to ashes to dust, there seems to be a uh, kind of like a change in a way. Uh, hymns for the hopeless, you get like our pass across again Sunday, kind of gospel, hand clapping that going on, and uh, a few up songs are a little bit more upbeat musically, you know, kind of like that. Whereas you go to uh, and there's a, there's a few song or two on it has a couple of drum parts. Yeah. Burn My Body. Yeah. My favorite. I have a little bit of song. Oh, um, cool. Thanks. Um, but you don't seem to do the same thing on the new CD. Why, why the change? Um, well, I just, I, it's sort of a continuation of the story of the, of the first record. And uh, and I guess I purposefully did it a little more sparse than the first record is. I didn't, didn't add much to any of the songs. And uh, I don't know, and also I think I was going through different things uh, than I was when I was writing the first record and, and sort of uh, having different experiences. And so maybe those themes kind of permeate the songs a little more too. And, and uh, so definitely whatever I'm going through at the time affects my songwriting and naturally. So are you saying that Hymns for the Hopeless is a concept album or is it more of a just one story that kind of it's definitely a story, yeah, uh, and, and it kind of continues on with the second record, and then this, the third record that I'll be recording in a couple of months will be kind of the next part of that, and I'm sort of just kind of keeping with the theme. So story. every record's basically a giant story. Yeah, yeah, sort of pretty autobiographical, and, and, uh, and yeah, so you can kind of tell where I was at the time by listening to what... It's, what it's a never-ending story without the big hairy flying dragon. Exactly, exactly.
Shine, 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 shine. 